Hi, somebody asked me if I could reverse engineer the Mixig DP1007 high voltage differential probe that we looked at, did a teardown of, and some experiments with in the previous video linked in down below if you haven't seen it. Because I have actually torn down a differential probe before and uh, explained with the intention of explaining how the differential probe actually works. So. Once again, linked in somewhere up here and down below. If you haven't seen that video, highly recommend it. It was quite prop popular. And this is where I uh, reverse engineered the uh, LaCroix slash Sapphire high voltage differential uh, probe. And if we take a squeeze at it here, you can see that it's really old school, all through hole design and everything. Absolutely fantastic. Designed by Mr. Wu. Everyone knows Mr. Wu designs the the best uh, probes. So <laughs> Mr. Wu from Sapphire, absolutely fantastic. Anyway, all through whole design and stuff like that. They did rub the numbers off the chips here, but meh, whatever. The intention was, was uh, actually to get a reverse engineered schematic of how this one worked. This one actually had uh, discrete FETs on the input and, a, you know, like a standard op amp differential amplifier front end, high voltage uh, resistor uh, divider string here and stuff like this. And this is how all high voltage uh, probes work. So we're going to have something very similar here, but instead of the discrete FETs here, we're actually going to have just FET input high speed, FET input op amps here. And so I thought, yeah, it'd be interesting to uh, just reverse engineer this and uh, get at least a, a partial schematic out of it. I don't want to do an absolute full schematic because I don't see any reason to like reverse engineer like the power supply and maybe the microcontroller and stuff down here. That's like, meh, it doesn't really matter. But this is not going to be a how to reverse engineer because I've already done an extensive video which was very popular. I got 153,000 views also linked in um, in the cards up here and down below. And this is how basically how to do reverse engineering of a PCB. In this particular case, I use the example of the Rigol DS1054Z oscilloscope and the front end for it. Lots of cool tips in here of how to actually do this. And uh, the way that I used in this particular case was to actually get photos of the board, make sure your camera's like right on top and it's centered and your board's flat. And then you convert them to black and white. And then you convert them, I use Earthen View here, Highly recommended. I'm an Earthen View fanboy. Um, I use Earthen View to uh, then convert to like what do I use the Find Edges tool so that it kind of uh, creates like an edge outline like this. I show how you can actually then. Um, lift them up and you can put them back down and then you can flop essentially flip-flop between <laughs> See what I did there? I'm here all week flip-flop between the top and the bottom so you can trace things out And the good thing about using the transparent overlays is that you can use marker pens to uh, then mark off all the components and traces. I use uh, whiteboard uh, markers and then you can mark them off. Anyway, there's lots of other um, tips in here that there you go. You can actually mark it up like this. This is a how to reverse engineer video and lots of tips how to do it. So I'm not gonna cover uh, that in this video. By the way, I mentioned this on Twitter and a lot of people seem to agree with me that I reckon that there's a niche market out there for a tool, a reverse engineering tool that was just dedicated to this particular car uh, task. And what it needs is, it's just like an image editor like this that allows you to load in two photos, one top, one bottom, possibly with some alignment and stuff like that, but you can do that uh, yourself. But then has like a big fader bar or something like that that just allows you to fade between the two images like this, right? top and bottom like that. And then it'd be really cool if it had like a toolbar up the top here that just allowed you to like mark it up. Mark like, you know, like a you could put like an X on like components. You can just click and it put like an X on a component that you've already marked off and maybe a different color highlight for traces and things like that. It'd, when you're on the top like this, it'd show all the components on the top that you've done. And then when you faded through to the bottom like this, it'd change to all the components that you've marked off the bottom and stuff like that. That would be really cool. Cool. Um, it'd be an absolute bonus if that particular program actually, you know, allowed you to like maybe create a schematic netlist or something like that in KiCad or something like that. That'd be really cool. But even like just a program, I'm sure there's some people out there who could just write this in like five minutes. But done. That's easy, Dave. No worries. Here it is. Um, yeah, like there's probably myself and a lot of other people would probably pay for a, a dedicated PCB reverse engineering 
tool like this? Leave it in the comments down below. I'm sure uh, all my audience can come up with many different ways to make such a program useful, but I think that would be really cool. Anyway, um, the, the way I'm fading between these at the moment is I'm actually using my video editing program, Magix uh, Vegas, formerly Sony Vegas, and I've just put the two images one on top of each other, and I'm just simply using the fader bar. I took these photos not intending to actually reverse engineer this, because it's important when you take these photos to have the board completely flat, like it needs to be completely flat, or the camera needs to be completely right angle with the board. And also you've got to use a proper one-to-one -one macro lens that really helps, otherwise you get like distortion of the board and, and you know, it warps uh, with the lens and, and things like that. So it's really important to uh, get that. So when I took these photos, which are available on my Flickr account, by the way, when I, oh, almost always when I do teardowns, I actually uh, not just do video, I actually take macro photos as well, and I always put those on my Flickr account. So I've probably got like a hundred different teardowns of all high-res teardown photos on my Flickr account. So I'll link that down below if I remember. So anyway, I didn't intend to actually do this reverse engineering video, otherwise I would have put a bit more effort into making sure these boards were completely flat. It's really difficult when you've got like cables like running off this thing and you've got big components like these tall components like the DC to DC converter or big electrolytic caps or whatever it is. It's often hard to ensure that your board is uh, completely flat relative to the camera and of course you can actually set this up and if I was uh, to do this I would have put the board in my light box with like little standoffs like this so like on each corner of the board so I knew that the board was completely flat and then it, the components wouldn't affect the you know it wouldn't wobble and all that but I just sort of like yeah, it just took basic uh, photos like this, so um, with no intention of reverse, reverse engineering. So I've done my best to sort of line them up and overlay top and bottom like that. So you can see, like on this side over here, it's a little bit off, um, but uh, yeah, it's it, it's good enough for Australia, right? I'm going to be able to easily reverse engineer this. So anyway, this one should be fairly easy to reverse engineer because although it is a four layer board and you can see the dark outline in there, that's the internal ground plane. You can see the ground planes like that and often uh, you can hold these things up to a light box, the board up to a light box as well. You can take photos of them through a light box and that helps like expose uh, the inner layers and stuff like that. But in this particular case, we've got hardly any traces on the bottom. Look, we just got a couple here like this, these are just like these are probably just uh, like power supply bypassing for the FET and uh, power supply filtering. So this one's going to be pretty easy. I shouldn't have to put much work into it. Now, of course, when like traces go under components like this, this is when you this the all these tips are in my reverse engineering video. You have, you might have to start off like you know scraping off you know, like the annulus ring around the via or something like that, and then probing out where things go and like you know sweeping your probe across the board to find where all the uh, traces go. And if you want all the values as well, you often have to go in there and measure them. And some of them are hard to do in circuit. But you know if you want to know what the value of these capacitors here is, I don't know. Is it you know a couple of puff? Is it tens? of puff, I don't know, something like that. They might even have to lift components out of circuit. So I'm not going to go into a huge depth to do this. It's just going to be a bit of a how you doing job. These high voltage differential probes, you know how they're going to work. They're going to have a symmetrical string like this. So I wouldn't even bother reverse engineering this bottom part down here like this. There's just no point because it's going to be completely identical to this top half up here. This is how differential amplifiers work. It only starts to differ when you start talking the nitty gritty details around the output um, side of the FET input buffer here and the output over here. Is <laughs> Once you've done all the work up there, <laughs> this bottom one, you just duplicate it. But of course, every circuit is different. Some are a pain in the ass, some are relatively easy like this one. I can see most of the traces. And the good thing is once you learn all your building block uh, circuits, uh, you can pretty much guess when you've gone wrong. Uh, like if you can see that, oh, this op amp doesn't have any feedback. Oh, oh I forgot to, you know, R49 there is probably the feedback resistor, uh, for example. So, you know, like it's pretty obvious when you've goofed up or you've shorted things out and it doesn't make any sense things are connected here or there that don't make any sense. And it, sometimes it's really obvious if you know your building blocks. It really helps. Um, if you were reverse engineering this without some of that knowledge, it's, it's just a little bit harder to spot obvious goofs. But I don't think I'm not going to print like a transparent overlay like I did for the uh, Rigol scope for this. I don't think I need to. I'm just going to fade between that and that. 
measure a few things and Bob's your uncle, um, hopefully we'll have a half polished turd of a schematic at the end of this. Okay, so I'm part of the way through and here's a progress, pretty easy up until this point, and now I've got to do the feedback resistor on the op amp here. Obviously it needs a feedback uh, resistor. You can see that, as I said, R49 here, that seems to be the feedback resistor, because look, two traces bugger off under here like this, so you've got to assume that that one goes down there. I actually have put the product back together, so I can't actually, um, <laughs> I have to crack it open if I want to measure anything at this point. So this is obviously going to the output, which is pin six here, and you can see that buggering off to the output uh, resistor divider here and the relay switch in for the gain. But you notice that there's no other resistor here, and obviously the other side of this R49 here obviously goes to pin two. Pin three is the positive, so that's the input, and then pin two is the negative the inverting input of the op amp but there's only one resistor and if I drag that under like that you can see that there's no other resistors on the bottom so if there's only a single resistor for the feedback like this and it's a standard op amp then well then you can see like these are, there's obviously an inductor here and a cap which then or a couple of caps uh, for different frequencies which then uh, powers the uh, chip so that's filtered but there's no other resistors here so obviously, by deduction, I can draw that resistor in there is going to the, um, the input like that. So it's a unity gain buffer. I didn't think that op amp was capable of unity gain, but apparently it is. No wackers whatsoever. There it is, 325 megahertz unity gain bandwidth. The maximum bandwidth, 325 meg. It's plenty. And then you'll notice that in here, the positive input here, it has two additional trim pots, which the negative side does not. So obviously they're using these to balance out the positive, all the variances in the positive input compared to the negative input. And this can uh, improve your common mode rejection ratio. So obviously once you've drawn this one, you know that this one's going to be identical, except that one of the resistors in here is going to be replaced by one of the trim pots. And you'll notice that sure enough, this has a block of four resistors here like this. This only has three of them and it goes off to the resistor here. So clearly it's exactly the same, except this resistor here, which is R34 has been replaced by a trim pot. So when you go in and draw it, there's our negative input there that has fixed resistors. The positive one just has that one there just replaced by a little trimmer there. And the other trimmer down here like this is just to compensate for the uh, gain divider that's fixed up here and they just um, and then trim it. Somebody goes uh, uh, with their tongue at the right angle and trims that sucker to the right value. So there you go, that makes sense. I don't even need to buzz that sort of stuff out on the board, even if you can't see the traces going under the parts or whatnot, which, well, you can't. Um, like, you know, there's some traces under here, which I just physically can't see, but it's obvious that's where they're going. Now here's a really annoying thing. I'm trying to trace out the microcontroller on here. What we've got on here is obviously a uh, QFN uh, 16 package, four pins per side there. It's one of these EFM 8 Busy B things or something B. You get the data sheet and there's no, there's an SOIC 16, but there's only QFN 20s. And sure enough, if I go to like DigiKey and search for all of the Busy B parts, 596 of them, the only available packages are 16 pin chip scale and uh, SOIC and, and the chip scale one is of course um, like the little BGA thing. Pain in the ass. So that's annoying. Is it like an obsolete package that they've discontinued or something? Or is it in some other series that DigiKey happened to not carry? Ah. And that's a trap for young players, including Dave. <laughs> I quickly realize that, yet yeah, here's the footprint. They're all QFN 20s. There's four extra pads on the corner there, which you can't actually see inside here like this. Like, you zoom, like I'm, I've also got like a zoomed in uh, picture up here. And oh no, actually, I can just see it. There it is there. Maybe. Can you see a tiny little bit of solder? on the side there. 
And there, and sure enough, I should have known, like, there's a track going in there. There you go. Yep, and another track going in there, and another one going in there, and that one's probably not connected, or it's going under there. Dole, and <laughs> QFN 20. Don't rely on your Mark 1 eyeball. <laughs> Trap the young players. Anyway, um, my input here comes across here, goes over to here, goes over to here. That's a not fitted part, and then goes into pin, now that I know it's a 20, pin 18. So, yep, goes into pin 18. So, the feedback from the output goes into pin 18. So, looking at the pinouts here, sorry I haven't got my green screen this time and couldn't be bothered turning my lights on, so, meh, whatever. Uh, and anyway, let's go down here to the package. 20 pin QFN, there it is there. So, pin 18 there is P04. 18, multifunction I.O., it's a P.O. mat. Whatever that is, it's an ADC. Okay, there you go. So it's an ADC input. Comparator, positive and negative. So I don't think they're doing any comparator function with it. Can't see why you do that on the output. This is this pin is directly sampling the output via two series resistors. That must be what measures the clip-in for the output. Because you saw in the previous video how the uh, lead button flashes if you get over range. That's how they're doing it. That's going into the ADC. And here's where we enter the bizarro world of the 6604. It's a SOT 6 pin SOT 23 package down here. And well, if you go look this up, um, <laughs> okay, there's no 16604. So if you actually know what's going on here, please leave it in the comments. But anyway, here's an MCH 6604 from On Semiconductor. Okay, it's a dual MOSFET, as you'd expect in a six pin package. If you, you know, you wouldn't get a six pin package uh, for a MOSFET unless you're. Uh, you know, unless it's a dual jobby. This one's actually not a SOT23 uh, package, so it's not the actual one. Anyway, it's a dual N-channel N power MOSFET. And we'll have a look at the pinout in a second, but if we go over to this one over here, this is an Alpha and Omega one, um, AO6604. And, well, it's, look, an N-channel and a P-channel. It's a 6-pin SOT23, so, yeah, okay. Right? So you can, you know, use them like as a totem pole output or something, uh, like, you know, totem pole driver or something like that. You know, really handy kind of thing. Motor drive, stuff like that. So, very handy. N channel and P channel in the same package. Nice. But you go over to this one. Uh, this is a Toshiba TPC6604 jobby. And, well, let's have a look at this one. Um, that doesn't look like a MOSFET. That looks like a <laughs> bipolar. Um, yeah, and it's a single, it's not a dual. So what the heck? Um, I found like three, just searching three different types of 6604. Anyway, if we go to the actual board in here, you can see they're actually connected in parallel, whatever it is that they've got inside in here. Look, parallel like that. These are the gate terminals on one of the package, the gate terminals, and this was like the uh, uh, source, I think, on one of them, or the drain, or whatever. And they're both connected in parallel, okay? And that obviously goes off to the relay drive. But this other one here, once again, they're connected parallel, depending on the configuration. And that's going up here. And I can't actually see under there, but, well, I don't know where... Uh, like, I assume it's going over to the other side of the relay here. So are they, like, differentially driving the relay? Why? I, uh, you know, the micros obviously are driving this thing, like the gate, this trace here, if this is the gate, right? I like, I think all the gates connected inside there like that. And if you have a look on the bottom side, there's just a couple of, there's just a couple of resistors and stuff in there. Um, and that'll go off to the micro, which drives it. But I don't... I don't know why or what the heck's going on with that relay drive, so I'm not even going to bother to try and include that. Anyway, relay switches on and off. <laughs> Which, like, I can only assume that they use the 6604 as a standard bomb item in many of their products, and they just didn't want another type of transistor in here. But there you go. Um, uh, no, they, these are diodes. Okay, no, I thought they were a little uh, three-pin uh, transistor. No, here's a no Q. Q5, here's a transistor over here. Whatever that one is, 703, why couldn't they use that to drive the relay? I don't, I don't get it. All you need is like a, a standard BJT to drive the... 
or a MOSFET or whatever single to drive the relay from like the plus 12 volt rail or whatever plus yeah it's plus minus 12 isn't it or whatever and uh, yeah I don't know I don't get it all right so we've got my final Dave CAD here only final because I really couldn't be bothered going in here and like reverse engineering the EFM 8 and the U6 and you'll see why in a second anyway oh, we've basically come to the conclusion that here's the output resistor here 50 ohm 49.9 ohms good enough for Australia um, and that drives the uh, coax out here and then we're actually I don't know why they're tapping off two here but they tap off the output here and then this goes into a dual op amp oh, I forgot to put the part number on there but anyway it goes into a dual op amp um, in a standard inverting uh, configuration here it's just drawn a bit differently don't when you look at uh, building blocks like this uh, the positive goes down to um, ground there via a matching resistor I've done a video on this and how that matches input bias currents and things like that but anyway you don't necessarily have to have it you can just ground uh, the non-inverting input there and that's a standard inverting op amp I don't know where that actually goes out to I presume it eventually goes back into the micro somewhere because what is the functionality of this thing it just simply reads the output and and flashes the lead for uh, like over range and and then it controls the relay um here so yeah like that'll have a like a transistor that weird r 6604 transistor driver in there to drive your uh, uh dual relay here and which uh, switches the gain, by the way, um, on both of the channels. But anyway, so the EFM-8, it, it doesn't really have to do much. But if we have a look at the actual board for this thing, oh, the bloody thing doesn't retain my um, zoomed-in status. Anyway, here it is. So here's our 50-ohm output resistor. This is our uh, coax up here. I've just zoomed in a bit more. And here's R26 that we had there. And that goes into this op-amp. It goes into uh, the op-amp here. So this is, I don't know what part that is, a TI-98. I had a look, OPMI. Had a look, I don't know. If you know what it is, leave it in the comments down below. But anyway, it looks like it is a TI jobby of some description. Uh, couldn't be bothered decoding the part number. But anyway, yeah, so the top oh, half of the op amp in there is a basic non-inverting, uh, sorry, inverting op amp. So I, I don't know what the bottom op amp here is doing. And look at all these parts around here. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, like, because once again, I... <laughs> I put this thing back together and I so I haven't bothered to actually I don't have access to it again and couldn't just couldn't be bothered taking it apart uh, to get into the nitty gritty detail but look there's a lot of stuff in here and what these diodes over here are doing and and stuff like that they've got three diodes over here we know that this tap R22 as we saw on the schematic this goes down here this jumps this actually jumps over to bleh, on the bottom side over to here and this is what then goes into that pin of the micro that we uh, saw which is actually either an ADC or a comparator I, I don't know where yeah I don't know what how it could be a comparator so I think that they're using that as an ADC but why they have to read off both sides of this um, I presume maybe it's got another error detection mode to detect shorted output like you know the load is shorted your oscilloscopes you know you shorted the output or whatever um, so yeah I don't know but there's an awful lot of stuff in there for a micro that's its only purpose essentially is to drive this relay off and on when you push a button <laughs> you know which range do you want the times 10 or the times 100 range and it just switches that relay and then it just flashes the lead when it's over range so all it needs is like a, an op amp and like the adc and bob's your uncle so i don't know i don't know if you've got any ideas leave it in the comments down below but yeah i couldn't be bothered actually reverse engineering um the whole kit and caboodle so Anyway, um, yeah, this is rather interesting. So uh, I am actually surprised that they use um, quite, uh, you know, like 1206 parts in here. I thought, you know, I'm surprised it survived the 1100 volts RMS that we actually put on it. Because normally I think 1206s only have a 250 or 300 volt rating each, don't they? So, you know, like you're really like, yeah, you're pushing your luck there. But it's interesting that uh, this one, and I think... Somebody on the forum mentioned that one of the higher end models doesn't have 
these trimmers or doesn't have one of these trimmers or something like that. I think it's the CMRR one from memory. So yeah, there. So anyway, they have added a common mode rejection ratio trimmer in here, which just means that you're matching because common mode rejection ratio will uh, involve yeah, you know, if these are unmatched, if the value of this string here, which includes these resistors and the lower divider resistor here, then uh, if they're unmatched, I should <laughs> show you the schematic for this. So if they bloody, yeah, why can't you keep the zoom status? What's going on here? Maybe there's a setting. I don't know. Anyway, I'm using Drawboard PDF for those who don't know. It's got like this laser tool that can, you know, if you draw it like this, it'll go like that really cool and you can just do up you know annotate pdfs it's really quite cool anyway i think it's designed for like it's an australian software which are uh, uh, designed for like uh, marking up pdfs for like architects and things like that i think um and stuff like that anyway uh we can have a yeah so if if this entire string here is unbalanced compared to this one up here, and that's going to screw up your common mode rejection ratio. So that's why they have the CMRR trimmer in there, and then they've got a gain trimmer here just to match uh, the gain um, for the differential amplifier here. This is a standard differential, um, a single op amp uh, differential amplifier circuit. They aren't using like a specific uh, diff amp. It's just a uh, very high speed um, regular op amp. And... Um, that's it. And they just do the relay switch in here for the gain, which uh, is determined by, of course, these resistors here and this one and these here. So they they determine the gain of this because these are just buffer amplifiers here. And that's it. Got a little bit of compensation there. Um, and this up here is interesting. This is a, uh, they've got a, a resistor on the bottom. NF means not fitted. So uh, that's just a common thing on schematics if it's not, or do not fit, or, you know, DNF or something like that, not fitted, DNF. Um, and yeah, so they've got these uh, footprints for the resistors, but this capacitor here, I've shown it as a shared capacitor. Because if we go over to the board here, you can see on the top side here, the, the resistors aren't fitted, and they've got these just pads. And of course, but a pad with another pad on the other side is a capacitor. So yeah, they're just using those and they got one big square pad on the bottom like that. I don't have the other one loaded up, but they got one big square pad and there's another resistor in here like this, which then goes to yeah here. It, it goes to here. So it's across that resistor there. So they got some sort of like compensation network that uses the PCB pads. And I'm not sure... You know, it obviously like some sort of upper resistor compensation or something. I, d I don't know what the, if you got any idea what they're trying to actually do there or tried to do. I, they didn't do it on the uh, production version, obviously. So, yeah, anyway, and they've got uh, dual compensation down here like this, um, which is, you know, going to town a bit. Don't know why they need the dual compensation, but, but anyway, like I haven't gone in and like measured part values and stuff like that. We just really want to look at the topology of this thing. And it is a pretty bog standard, uh, you know, implementation of a high voltage differential amplifier. The high voltage uh, stream, the high voltage resistors like this, the lower side of the resistor divider, completely matched um, uh, positive and negative. And this is, uh, once again, have a look at that video of how a differential uh, probe works. I go into a bit more detail, but... There you go. Um, that's, yeah, interesting. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what all this stuff and what's going on here. I don't know. That's strange. <laughs> Got any idea? Leave it in the comments down below. But I hope you found that video interesting. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.